So welcome to this video that is called Panoramic View of Linear Algebra. So um, the purpose of this video is to give you the bird's eye view of the whole standard linear algebra course of the first semester. And the idea is to enable you to see in one shot in a very condensed and concentrated video, all the important concepts and only all the important theorems and the connection between them in this course. Obviously this course is, course is very important because linear algebra is ubiquitous in all of physics and in engineering and everywhere. And the reason that linear algebra is so important is because for the linear types of problems, we do have a closed formula solution. We have an explicit solution, whereas for the nonlinear uh, cases, we have to find approximate and numeric solutions. I mean, this is the typical case. Yeah? And so the importance of linear algebra uh, in every aspect of mathematics and physics and engineering cannot be overestimated. And so um, in, the, in this course, specifically in this video, it's like a crash course, but it's gonna have rigorous proofs of all the important results, of all the important theorems, and um, it will help you to organize the material in a logical hierarchical way that will leave you with a long lasting understanding, deep understanding and knowledge of the uh, course that will uh, be with you for a very, 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 very long time and will enable you to reproduce it yourself. So if you will organize the material in a clear hierarchical way, logical way, you will remember it and you will be able to derive it yourself. Now, of course, this video cannot be considered as a replacement to an, an entire semester course because this is very like a condensed video. And uh, I mean, a semester course is a semester course. You get more tutorials and, and, and more uh, topics that are being covered here. I focus only on the uh, really conceptually hard parts. I skip elementary parts like uh, gauss jordan elimination and uh, uh, matrix multiplication and, and things like that. And I really focus on the abstract and, and the hard topics. Uh, and in addition, so for whom this course will be good. So for somebody who have already taken this course and wants to refresh the material and gain better understanding and repeat his knowledge, or for somebody who is preparing for an exam, this video is going to be a perfect video for you. And so I would like to really give you a bold promise here. So if you'll follow this video, it will give you a good understanding and a good lasting knowledge of the subject. And uh, it will stay with you for, for a long time. You will be able to redrive everything myself. I know I'm kind of repeating my, uh, myself. And this is a very bold promise and a bold statement. And so I would like to make a deal if you feel that you've watched the video until the end, followed all the details, and uh, you feel that the video did not deliver upon its promise, then feel free, and I would even encourage you to dislike this video and uh, write in the comments everything that is wrong with it. But if, on the other hand, you feel that it really fulfilled its promise and you now have much better understanding, then I would like you to subscribe to my channel, to hit the bell button and to share this video with others to help them master the important subject of linear algebra as well and have a deep uh, knowledge of the subject, at least of this first uh, uh, level level course. Um, so what maybe one more thing that I wanted to mention is that, uh, yeah, oh, the, the video, the, the lecture notes that I've written are available in, in the description and they're very detailed with explanation. It takes 35 pages. And I mean, I wrote it uh, all out of, out of my head without looking in any book. And I'm telling you this not in order to brag, but to uh, I'm bringing it as a proof that if you organize the material in a logical hierarchical way, then it is absolutely possible to remember perfectly with rigorous proof, the subjects and, uh, and theorems and the relations between them. And so, it's totally doable. If you have a deep understanding, then a good understanding of uh, of the theorems and the definitions, then you will remember it uh, because it's easier to remember things that you understand and you, you know the logical connection between them. And for students, I, I often find that when they uh, struggle with the course, it's al always the case that it's not that they're not smart enough, it's that they somewhere lost the lecture, lost the material, and they didn't understand in depth all the definitions. Once, once uh, I helped the students with understanding the definitions, they were uh, doing much better. And this tutorial, this lecture that I'm going to uh, 
uh, right now uh, for you is uh, when I was a teaching assistant in this course, I would uh, uh, do this as a review tutorial before an exam, and I would have very good feedbacks from my students that uh, would say that they performed much better than they expected and that this was very help helpful for them and really helped them to get a very good and very high score in their exam. So without further ado, let's uh, dive into the subject. And so I have uh, my own uh, kind of method and way of representing the subject. So the first really hard uh, concept that we encounter in this course is the, in the, is the concept of vector spaces, vector space. Uh, now, the idea about vector spaces is that we want to take the properties that we have in R3, a well-known familiar three-dimensional space that we live in, and we have good experience with this. And obviously, it has a very rich mathematical structure. It describes vectors, it can describe forces, motions, etc. And so we really want to see what's the what makes this space so important and, and uh, uh, so interesting. What are the key properties that we can... Uh, learn and study and generalize to other spaces as well. And well, it comes with, it's pretty abstract notion of the vector space because it comes with all those axioms. And the thing is that students have a hard time of remembering all those axioms in the first place. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of axioms. And when obviously often uh, students uh, don't see the entire meaning of this, it's, it's hard to remember all of it. So I would like to mention, uh, to define a concept that is usually skipped in this standard course, but if you remember it in and understand it, it will help you to remember all the axioms. And we'll see that once you understand this notion, this notion is a notion of a group. It's a super important uh, mathematical structure, algebraic structure that is ubiquitous in mathematics and in physics and engineering and, and even chemistry. Uh, so uh, most of the time it is omitted in an introductory course, but knowing this will definitely help you and will defi is definitely worth your time. So even if it's skipped, I, it's, it's uh, a bit step aside, but bear with me for now. And let's uh, define the notion of a group. So uh, a group is a non-empty set G. Uh, that is endowed with a binary operation. So this operation is typically denoted by this dot. And this is actually, uh, we'll see that this is more like a function, but more about this later, uh, such that the following properties hold. Okay, and what properties exactly? Well, so property number one is that for every a, b in g, when we take any two elements, then this dot is like a rule that assigns to every two elements of g another element of g. So it is similar in a sense if we consider the natural numbers and we think about the addition. So when we add two numbers, we get another number. And in fact, the first function that we ever encounter and ever learn in our lives is actually a function, if you think of it, not of one variable, but of two variables. Exactly the addition function is a function of two variables. It takes two numbers and assigns a third number to them, which we think of as their sum. So this is quite a uh, familiar situation. So. Uh, we'll later give a more formal definition of what we mean by a binary action, but for now we can think of it as a rule that takes two elements of G and assigns a third element to them. And another rule is the associativity with which you are familiar uh, with, say, addition and multiplication, so uh, in of numbers, for example. So for every A, B, C, and G, we have that when we first take the product of B and C and then the product with A, it is the same as first take the product of A and B and then product with C. And then uh, three. So there is an identity element. So there exists a special element in G, which is called <coughs> the identity. Actually, this E comes from the German Eins element, 
unique element or something like this. So um, E uh, such that for every element A in G, we have now uh, AE equals to EA equals A. So it, this is the identity basically for this. Uh, so if we think about addition, for example, then the identity of uh, the addition operation is just the zero, right? So take zero, you add it to every number and you have the same number. Or in multiplication, if you think about numbers, the example of numbers, then the multiplicative identity is this unit element. This is just one. One times any number is this number. And then this action, the, the, this is the important, the, the important concept. For up, up to now, this is a definition of a monoid. But now, uh, the very important concept that all those actions that we're doing are invertible. So for every A in G, uh, we have a special element that we call A inverse in G, such that A, A inverse equals A inverse A, this is just the identity element, okay? So that's the definition of a group. It's super important and you actually know a lot of examples and a lot of groups you've encountered during your studies, uh, starting from elementary school. So for example, we know that, uh, yeah, one more thing that I would like to add, note that uh, as opposed to our experience with numbers, I never mentioned that AB is the same as BA. And in general, for a general group, it's it's not going to be the case. We'll see. But there is a special name for groups that satisfy this, this relation. They are called abelian groups. But for example, you know that uh, if we consider matrices, yeah, we can take product of matrices. So if A and B are not square matrices, then it can happen that A B is defined, but um, it can it can be that B A is this could be defined. And these could be not defined as an example with, with matrices. So the order does matter. And so we'll see that this is a very important special case that is called a Bellion group when, when this holds. But this is definitely not one of the group's axioms. So uh, we will say uh, another definition. So let's say that a group G is said to be abelian if for all a b and g holds that a b equals b a and abelian after the norwegian mathematician uh niels henry cobble and this is a very important concept of abelian groups but groups don't have to be abelian and so now let's see some examples of groups that we know. So, for example, we know the, the integer numbers, right? And so when we specify a group, we would like to say, we need to say what is the set that is an non-empty set. We say what is the action, so with respect to addition, and we say the identity element. So it can be easily seen that this is a group. This is a group, and our binary action is addition of numbers, of natural numbers. So, of course, for every integer n in z, we have the inverse minus n, which is an element in, in z as well. And then we know that n plus minus n is 0, which is the identity element. So each element has an inverse. This is the reason, for example, that if we consider the natural numbers with, uh, with addition and 0, this is not a group, right? Because for if we take any element, say one, there is no element in n, there is, there is no element, there doesn't exist. It's not the case. There doesn't exist a in natural numbers, right? Such that one plus a equals the zero, right? It doesn't happen. So this is not a group, but it satisfies the first three properties. So the uh, whenever I take two natural numbers, their sum is a natural number, and the addition is associative, and zero is the identity with respect to addition, but it has no inverse. So this fourth axiom turns out to be crucially important. So another example of group, which you encounter often, uh, is 
For example, the rational numbers. If we take the rational numbers, there are much more than a group with respect to addition and the zero. So this is also is an abelian group. And we can continue. Let's see another example. So if we take the rational numbers, okay, and now we take uh, the rational numbers without the zero. So uh, without the zero, and we take the product, and we consider the unit element just the one. This is is an abelian group. Well, we know you may know that uh, the uh, natural uh, the rational numbers actually form a field, right? And so this is important, you know, to to throw uh, away the zero, to toss away the zero because the zero has no multiplicative inverse. So the rational numbers with the zero wouldn't have been wouldn't have been a group. Uh, another example of groups. So yeah, and by the way, this action is multiplication. So for example, the unit circle. If you know complex numbers and you take the unit circle S one here that sits in the complex numbers, then for every number here of the form uh, cosine theta plus i sine theta, that's an element of S1, this is the unit circle, then there's actually uh, a product rule. So if we take another element here, say uh, cosine uh, phi plus i sine phi, yeah, that's a complex number. So their product is well defined, and that's another element because you know that cosine theta plus i sine theta times cosine phi and i sine phi. This is actually cosine theta plus phi. This is immediate from trigonometric identities or properties of the complex numbers, and sine theta plus phi. So the arguments are added. So we can see that this product. Uh, of complex unit uh, complex numbers is acting on, on itself as uh, a rotation by an angle. And obviously there is an inverse because if I take this cosine uh, uh, phi, for example, cosine phi plus i sine phi, and if I multiply it by its inverse, just take phi to be minus phi times cosine phi minus i sine phi. Let, let's take it like this, minus phi here. This is uh, the cosine is even function, so minus phi uh, doesn't affect it. Then we get exactly one because this is just like z z times uh, the conjugate of z, which is the absolute value squared, and in this case, uh, this is one. So this is a group as well, and it's a very important group. Uh, another group that you uh, would encounter is just take any x. Just take x to be a set, non-empty, and consider uh, just s of x. It is called the symmetric group of x. Consider all the functions that are going from x to x that are bijections, bijections. So they are one to one and onto, right? And then uh, so uh, the with respect, so if we take uh, Sx as a set, so x is some set, we consider all the bijections, that is all the functions that are one-to-one -one and onto. We take the action to be composition and the identity element would be the identity function of x. So uh, idx is a function from x to x that, you know, that idx of every x is just x, yeah? So, this is the identity the identity map. So with respect to composition, we know that uh, whenever we take a composition of two functions, if f and g are bijections, then uh, f uh, composition with g is going to be a bijection. And we know that composition of functions is also associative. And since uh, every function here is a bijection, so whenever we have f that is a bijection, we have the inverse of f is exactly such a function uh, that this composition, composition gives the identity function of x. So this is a group, this is also a very important group. Uh, so, uh, and another super, super important group in all of mathematics and all of physics as well, is uh, what is called the general linear group. So don't worry if it becomes complicated. Well, uh, this, those are just examples of groups. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip the 
to the, the other things uh, just shortly. But this is important, you know, to understand this example and how important this is. And soon we'll get back to the more familiar material. So GLNR is the set of all invertible matrices. So this is uh, A. They, those are n, uh, n by n matrices, square matrices, such that A is invertible, or we could say that if you know it, if it's not understandable at this point, don't worry about this, it will soon be understandable, with a non-zero determinant, then this is actually the group of all invertible matrices, and obviously the identity matrix is the identity, and this is a group with respect to matrix multiplication. Okay, so let's get back to the more uh, familiar material in neural algebra. This could have been like a step aside, but if you understood what I was saying, you will see that now remembering all the axioms that you encounter in the course and all those con uh, abstract concepts will become much easier. So you know that a vector field is defined over a field. Now, uh, a field, for example, you know that a field is, uh, we have the field of reals, we have the field of complex numbers, and we have the field of racial numbers. And um, in some sense, every every field that isn't finite has to contain, in a way, the field of rational numbers, but we'll not go deeper into that. And there are also examples of, of finite fields, but let us first define the notion of field. So the idea of a field is to take the properties that we have in real numbers, that we can add real numbers, and we can multiply them uh, and we can have inter inverses as long as this is a non-zero number. And so the idea is to take the essential properties here and to generalize them. And so the idea is the following one. So let us define the notion of field. So let F be a, let's say, definition. So a field has 11 axioms, and it's really hard for students to remember. But if you understand the notion of a group or an abelian group for now, you will see how easy it is to remember the definition of a field. So let F be uh, a non-empty set. Okay, that's a non-empty set with uh, two special elements. One of them will be called zero and the other special element we'll call it one this is just a name it's not necessarily the real number zero or the the complex number zero or, or one but those are the the names of the identities it's it's convenient and it's also important that those are distinct elements right uh such that okay such that uh f is endowed with two binary operations. So one would be uh, called plus, which is the addition, and another one is called the product, okay? Uh, and though uh, such that the following holds. So in your typical linear algebra course, they would now specify 11 axioms. But let's see how I would do it. So we say that F, together with addition and this zero element, is an abelian group. And if we take F without the zero, and with the product and with this identity element, that this is also is an abelian group. Okay, I don't know if you noticed, but we just specified here 10 axioms. And see how easy it is to remember them, it's effortlessly. I mean, if you remember or understand the definition of the group, it will take a zero effort to reproduce the five axioms here and the five axioms here. And the last axiom that we need to mention here is the interaction between the product and the addition. And that's just the distributive law. So the distributive law says that for all uh, A, B, and C, and F holds A times B plus C equals AB plus BC. That's the usual distributive 
distributive law. So here are 11 axioms effortlessly, right? So if you organize uh, the material in, in, in your head in a logical way, it will be easier to, f to, to remember. And so now we can see that obviously uh, the examples, so if we take the rational numbers, so if we take the rational numbers uh, with uh, uh, the addition and the product and the zero of rational numbers and the identity element one, then this is a field, right? This is easily seen to be a field. And we also have the field of uh, the real numbers, class and product. The usual product of numbers is a field. And actually, there are a lot of fields in between uh, that are subsets of the real numbers and contain the rational numbers. And there are also examples of finite fields, of which we're not going to talk about. And finally, one of the most important fields uh, is the field of the complex numbers is when we take the complex with the addition of complex numbers and the product of complex numbers with the zero element is the identity of addition and the unit uh, complex number is the identity of a product this is also a field okay and so now let's get back to vector spaces vector spaces is just the first jump in obstruction now we all know how to add vectors. So suppose that uh, we are in R3, right? And you know, you've had even, I guess in high school, so if we have a vector here, V, then all vectors parallel to V uh, and of the same magnitude is, is, is the same. So all we care about is uh, direction uh, and magnitude. And we have another vector W. So for example, this is a vector W. Yeah, then W matters only, it doesn't matter where to what point W is attached it's important just the direction of the magnitude. So if we would like to add W to V or V to W, we uh, can transport parallelly W to here and then form this diagonal of, uh, of a parallelogram. And this vector that we draw here is their addition. And this addition of vectors has really nice uh, properties. And essentially, if we'll take a look at the properties, so of course, V plus W is, say, let's, talk about R3 here, is a vector in R3, right? So we basically what we say that there is an addition operation defined on vectors and we can add vectors and their sum is another vector, right? Um, yeah, that, that was part of that already. I, I hope it is familiar to the axioms of a group. And what we have here is that, you know, like in forces, if we have a vector here, V, and we have here a vector minus V, yeah, then their additions is like the forces balancing out. So for every v, we have a vector that is, uh, we call it minus v, and their sum is zero, which is the identity. And zero plus v is just v for every v uh, that is a vector. And of course, the addition of vectors is associative, v plus uh, w1 uh, plus uh, w2 is the same as v uh, plus w1 plus w2. This is associative and of course v plus w is w plus v. And so we have here the axioms of an abelian group. Not such a big surprise. And another thing that we have here in, in the space is that we can take vectors and scale them by real numbers. For example, if this is a vector v, then we can multiply it by any scalar and this would be like stretching it. This is alpha v. So there is an interaction between vectors and scalars, right? We can uh, scale, we can scale a vector with a scalar. So there is actually a field of scalars in this case, this is the field of the real numbers that we can take vector and scale it up. So if we were now to generalize those properties and write them as axioms for, uh, for a general vector space, right? Then we would write this in the following way. Basically what we want to take is to take what we have uh, in real numbers and uh, this vector space R3 and just to take the essential properties that we have seen and generalize them. So let's go to the definition of a vector space. So uh, the definition is the following one. So um, we consider uh, V to be uh, with a special uh, element. Well, let's take the plus here with some uh, binary operation. Okay, you know what, let's just make it clean. 
let's take v with addition and with the zero, right? B an abelian group, right? So here uh, we have v just sort of as the R3 space that we have there. This is an abelian group with respect to addition, so that we have a way to add vectors in, in a way that will form an abelian group. And now we would have an interaction. We want a field of scalars that kind of scales up those vectors. So we would have the interaction between scalars and vectors here. Uh, and okay, and let F be a field. Okay, so this is a field. Okay, uh, so we say V is said to be a vector space over F if, uh, um, yeah, if. So what I wanted to say, if uh, the following uh, holds. Okay, and basically what I need to say that there exists, there exists, I would say uh, the, 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 there is defined a product. So the rigorous way to say that, that we have some function that takes a scalar in the field and a vector, right, and gives us back a vector. So what this says is that I can take a scalar and a vector and obtain a vector by scaling this vector by scalar. So we will be writing this new function. There exists a, uh, a function, this function, u, uh, and we will write it written as. So this is for, for the rigor, but we will write uh, just if we take a scalar alpha in the field and a vector v, then mu of alpha and v will write it just as alpha v. Yeah, such that the following holds. Oh, I sorry, I'm sorry. I uh, already had this the following holds, but okay, excuse me for the sloppiness in the definition here. I'll be more rigorous. So we have that the addition of vectors in is an abelian group. We have some abelian group uh, which, where we can add and we think of the elements of this V as vectors. And we need the following. So we need this field. And so first of all, uh, for all vector V and V, we in our field uh, have the unit element with respect to product, right? And the unit uh, scalar in F, we have that the product of this unit scalar with the vector is the vector itself. That's an axiom of what it takes to be a vector space. Every vector space, when we specify a field of scalar, has scholars has to satisfy this with respect to this unit. So in R3, this is like obvious, yeah? We take a vector and we scale it up by a factor of one, it's the same vector. And this is one of the axioms in uh, of the vector, uh, vector space. So another axiom would be, uh, which is really, you know, think of our R3 here. So for every alpha and beta, which are scalars in the field, if we take alpha and then beta times v, so first we take the vector, scale it by beta, and we get another vector. And then we take this vector and scale it by alpha. This is the same as if we were first to take the product in the field of the scalars alpha and beta, and then we will act with this product on the vector v. Now, it seems kind of obvious when we think about R3, but you, you have to understand that those actions, at least for an abstract vector space, are uh, essentially different. So this is, yeah, and this is for all, this is also for all V and V. This is different because here we take a scalar act on vector, and then we obtain a vector, and then we take another scalar and scale the result. And here, first of all, we take the product of scalars and then act upon the vector. But if you think about R3, then this axiom is kind of obvious, okay? Uh, three. Three, well, uh, for every alpha, beta in F, uh, and for every, and for every V and V, this is another axiom, but in R3, uh, you know, we're used to it. This is the distribution. If we take the sum of uh, two scalars, which is defined in the field, and we act upon the vector, then this would be, uh, with no surprise, as to act to scale V by alpha, 
and to obtain a vector and then to scale it by beta and then to add the result. This is the same. And finally, what we need is that for every alpha in F uh, and for all V, W, E, and V holds uh, that alpha V plus W is the same as alpha V plus beta W. So this is an interaction of here we had first the sum of scalars in the field acting on a vector. Here we have a sky scalar that is act acting on the sum of vectors in, in the vector field, in the vector space. Yeah. So uh, now I, I hope that when I presented the, it in this way, it kind of seems the these axioms of field and of vector space, it kind of feel more natural. Sometimes students miss uh, the naturality of those abstract definitions, and hopefully um, it is more uh, intuitive now uh, as I presented it. So, for example, what we know if is that in R3, for example, if we take the zero scalar times the any vector, this is the zero vector. So here it's it's important to distinguish them. This is zero scalar. So this is the, the real number zero, and this is actually the zero vector. Yeah, this is an element in R3. We still write it as zero, but we, we really need to understand where, where it comes from. And this is an element of R. This belongs this belongs to R. Right? So uh, in R3 we definitely have this uh, property, but this is not one of the axioms, right? This is not an axiom in in the definition of a vector space. So the question is, does it hold in general in a general vector space? And we would expect that it does, except that if it's not an axiom, that, then we have to prove it or disprove it. So we have the following proposition here, which says that all the properties that we are familiar with, not all the properties, but some of the actual properties that we're familiar with uh, in R3 hold for a general vector space. <laughs> So we have the following proposition. Yeah. And now you will see the naturality of it and you will remember it and it will be easy for you to derive it as well. So let V be a vector space a over F. Uh, F is a field, of course, over, um, yeah, I said that this is a field. But, you know, whenever I'm not going to say it, just assume, unless I say otherwise, V is always a vector space over a field F, unless stated otherwise. So this is to protect myself from future possible, you know, mistakes. Uh, so here we have uh, V vector field over uh, the field F. Uh, then uh, the following holds. Okay, and so one, it seems kind of dumb and obvious when you write this, but for abstract vector space, this is not so clear. So as I said here, if V is an abstract vector space, this holds for every uh, V and V. And uh, okay, zero is, an is the zero element in the field, and this is the zero vector. So this is something that requires a proof. And here's another thing, minus V equals minus one times v and so if you were you know looking at me like what does and this is holds for every v and v and if you're looking at me like now and thinking well th this is obvious but let me tell you why this is not obvious so what is minus v v uh here is an abelian group with respect to addition right and minus v is a vector that if you add it to v v plus minus v has to be the zero vector. This is the additive inverse of V in the abelian group V. Now, what, what is minus one uh, times V? Well, minus one, we have the unit element in the field. So if I'll write it over here, we have the unit element in the field and the field is also an abelian group. So you have the additive inverse of this one, which is minus one. This is an element of the field. And you have a way of taking a product of scalars in the field with vectors in V. And so what I say here 
that if you take the additive inverse of the unit element and the field and you multiply it by the vector v, then you will get the additive inverse of v in the evaluating group v. That's, that's the important thing here. Okay? So at first it is important to make this distinction. And finally, uh, for all scalars alpha in the field, if we take alpha times the zero vector this time, we get back the zero vector. Okay? So this actually requires a proof. So let's see. So we know that zero v is the same as, uh, sorry, this is the same as, uh, actually by one of the axioms in the field, we can first add zero to zero in the field, and this is the same as the zero of scalar, and then act upon it on v. And then another axiom says that we can actually distribute this. So this is actually zero v plus zero v. And we know that those are vectors, those are elements in, uh, in an abelian group. Now, uh, since those are elements in the abelian group, I can add to both sides the inverse, the additive inverse of zero v. This is some vector, and I don't know that this is the zero vector. I know nothing. But I know that this is an element in an abelian group, and there is an additive inverse. So I will just add minus of zero v to both sides. So when I take o, uh, zero v plus the end additive inverse of zero v, this is supposed to be zero, the zero vector. And here this is the zero v plus the zero v plus the additive inverse of zero v. Now the thing is that uh, we know that this has to be the zero vector. Uh, and I'm using here uh, associativity of the addition, uh, by the way, because it doesn't matter. I can add those two first and then add the results to this. And we know that zero is the identity, additive identity. So as the result, I'm going to get zero v. And this is the proof we have seen, we have shown now that the, if we take the zero scalar times any vector is the zero vector. Okay, and similar proof will follow for the second part. So the, the proof of the second part is the following one. So if I take v, right, one times v, v is the same as one times v, okay? And now what I can do is suppose that I act, I take one plus the inverse in the field of the unit times v. So this is clearly zero v and we've proved that this is zero. Now, if we use the distributive law, then we have that this is one times v, which is v, and plus the action of the, I take the minus unity scalar in the field times the vector v. And now I can add the additive inverse of v to both sides. So I would have that minus, uh, yeah, let's, let's give this. I add minus v to the zero, I get minus v, and I add the additive inverse of v to here, so this is zero, and I'm left with minus the unit scalar as it acts on the vector v. So we've proved that the additive inverse of v in the abelian group is the same as acting upon v with the inverse, additive inverse of the unit in the field. And finally, if I take any scalar alpha uh, times the zero vector, it is the same as acting with alpha on the zero vector plus the zero vector. And now by another axiom of how I distribute the action of scalars and vectors, this is zero alpha plus uh, alpha zero. And this is some vector, but the uh, the the set V with the addition is actually an abelian group. So I can add to both sides the additive inverse of uh, alpha zero, right? And so once I add this, I have that the zero vector is actually alpha zero. So we've proved those properties that seem obvious. We've proved them uh, now for a general vector space, okay? So um, let's keep moving forward and well, we've seen that in order to show that some uh, set is a vector space over a field, that's still, uh, even with the shortened version, that's a lot of properties to check. And here comes the notion of vector subspace. Now, uh, this notion is useful for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you want to understand a big complicated structure, it's always useful to understand 
a substructure of it which is some in in some way similar uh, to it but smaller so it's always useful to understand simpler substructure and this approach is really uh, like everywhere in mathematics just to understand something something simpler a simpler substructure and the other thing is that when we want to prove that something is a vector space well, and we, we consider it first as a set, if it is a subset of something that is already known to be a vector space, then our job becomes much easier. So first let us define the notion of what it means to be a vector subspace. So definition. So the definition here is of subspace. Of course, it's a vector subspace. Subspace. Okay, so let's define this notion. So um, let V be a vector space. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, over F uh, space, let's say, over F. And let W be just some subset of V, okay? Such that, okay, I'll make the distinction for once, zero, so Let's call it zero V for now. This is the zero vector of the bigger space V, and it has to belong to W. So the uh, additive identity of the uh, vector space V has to belong to the subset W, right? Uh, so in particular, this means that W is not empty. Okay, this is important. So W is not empty. Then we say, that W is a subspace of V. So what we take, we have the addition operation on all of V and the multiplication by a scalar that is defined on all of V and F. And now what we can do, we can restrict, we can restrict those actions to, to W. And here, here's the main insight uh, here. So, uh, if those properties of associativity hold for all of V, then of course when we restrict it to a smaller subspace W, it's still gonna hold. And uh, that this holds for the other properties as well. Many of the properties of multiplication by, by a scalar. If it holds to all of V, then it will continue to hold when it's restricted to W. So there is a narrow uh, collection, a small collection of properties that we need to check much smaller to verify that to show that W is a subspace of uh, some known space. Yeah, so we say that uh, W is a subspace of V uh, if W becomes a vector space over F. Uh, when we restrict uh, the addition and the scalar scalar multiplication from V to W. So when we take those uh, operations that are already defined on V and we restrict it to W, if W becomes a vector space in its own right, then W is a vector subspace of V. Okay, so, uh, okay. so let's uh, prove a theorem here that will actually show us that when we have a vector space and we have a subspace of this vector space, then it is much easier to prove that this is a vector space, uh, or showing it that this is a subspace. So theorem. Okay. So let V be a vector space over the field F. And let W be a subset of V 
uh, such that the following holds. Okay, so number one, the zero of V, which we'll just denote by zero, belongs to W. This is important, okay? So the zero vector of V is the same as, uh, it is an element of W, so W is not empty. This implies that W is not empty. And then the second is that uh, for all W1, W2, which are in W, if we add them, we still get an element of W, right? This is, I mean, the minimum, this is an, a necessary requirement. If you want W to be uh, a vector space in its own right, then we better have that when we add vectors in W, we still get a vector in W. And finally, number three, it's also kind of a minimal uh, condition, is that for every scalar alpha in the field, because it's over the same field, everything happens in, um, over the same field, and for every W in W, we have that alpha W still belongs to W. So if this holds, then W is a vector subspace of V, and therefore is a vector space in its own right. And so we see that in order to prove that some subset of a known vector space is a vector space, we only need to verify three properties as opposed to, uh, say, 10 properties that we need to check. So it's really more straightforward. And so let's follow the proof of the theorem. It's, it's uh, quite easy. Uh, we just go over the list once, and then we see that you know, we've, we have all, all that we need here. And so here I would like to emphasize again the importance of the notion of the subspace, because students often you know, tend to miss this. So, uh, uh, when, so the proof is just to go over the list of all the axioms and see that uh, they, they keep hold. So the idea here is that most of the axioms regarding the addition of, and the multiplication of scholars that hold on, on V will continue to be valid when restricted to W. So the closure, so let's go by one by one. So the closure with respect to addition uh, holds by assumption one, right? So we assumed in the theorem that uh, when we, whenever, uh, by assumption two, so whenever we take two vectors, uh, W1 and W2, and we add them together, we get another vector of W. So the closure with respect to addition holds, right? So this, uh, we can say a check. Uh, okay, since the associativity and the commutativity of the addition hold for all of V, right? The addition on all the vectors of V uh, uh, is satisfied, the commutativity and the associativity of the addition. Then clearly, when we restrict it to a subset of V, it will continue to hold. So we have this. Now, the next thing that, you know, to verify that W is an abelian group, we need to have the zero element. And by uh, the first assumption, we assume that uh, the zero uh, vector in, uh, the zero vector in uh, of V belongs to W. So this implies that W is not empty, right? So maybe I'll, I'll write it, uh, it's, it's kind of obvious. I'll just, I'll just say it. So let's just keep going. Uh, so we have the additive identity is in W, okay? And so now what we need to prove is that uh, we have an additive inverse. So let's see how do we do it. So um, we know that by assumption three, uh, by uh, property three, for every alpha in F, right? Uh, we have alpha W belongs to W, okay? But how do I use this to prove that, um, that that for every element we have the additive inverse, right? That W is an abelian group. Well, in particular, in particular, I can take minus one, which is an element of the field, right? We know that it's an element in the field. And then when I consider minus one times W, we have already proved that this is actually the additive inverse of W, right? So then W plus minus one times W, this has to uh, be a vector in, this has to belong to W 
because of the W is close to addition. But this is just W plus the minus of W, as we proved. And this is the zero. So W is actually an abelian group. We have, the, we have showed from uh, our assumption that if this assumption holds, then for every W in W, you have its additive inverse that is also in W. So this is good. Okay, and uh, so each element has its inverse. Um, so what we've proved is that so W with respect to uh, addition and the identity element, the zero, is an abelian group. So now what we need to show is those, those interactions between uh, multiplication by scalars and, uh, uh, and, and, and vectors uh, continue to be valued for W, but for all of them it's kind of obvious because uh, if it holds for all of V, it keeps holding for all of W. Uh, so the only non-obvious thing here, so for example if we go on something like alpha, we need to show that for every alpha beta, alpha times beta times W is the same as alpha beta W. But this holds for every alpha beta in F and every uh, actually V in V. So in particular, when we restrict it to W, it will continue to be valid. So the only thing that we really need to check is that uh, when we take for every alpha in F and for every W in W, we only need to check that alpha W is in W. But this is already one of the assumptions. And therefore, thus, W is uh, let's say is a vector is a vector space over F and in particular a subspace of V. Okay, so we've proved this. So let's keep moving forward. We're making uh, good progress here with a lot of abstract notions, uh, hopefully now uh, um, formalized and became like, a bit more clear, I hope. Okay, so now let's go to the other property of vector spaces. So another corollary that we can prove here is that, well, it's that's our formulation of uh, the previous uh, property that we had. Sometimes it's uh, more convenient. So let V be a vector space over the field F, right? And, uh, uh, okay, so if the following holds, so what we need here is actually compacting the three conditions to two conditions, it's essentially the same. So we need the zero of V uh, to belong to W. And secondly, so in particular, W is not empty. And then for every alpha and beta in F, uh, and every W1, W2 that is in W uh, holds alpha W1 plus beta W2 uh, belongs to W, then W is a subspace of V. Well, this is, uh, the proof is obvious here, because, well, first of all, we just only need now to check the three properties uh, that we previously mentioned. So clearly, uh, clearly zero belongs to W, so this is good, so this is a check. And now we need to check that W is closed with respect to addition, so we show the second property. Uh, so now, in particular, uh, choosing uh, alpha 1 uh, being uh, alpha 2 being 1, we know that whenever then alpha uh, 1 w1 plus alpha 2 w2, and we show them to be 1, so this is 1 times w1 plus 1 times w2, but by the axioms of vector space, we know that this is just W1 plus W2. This is one of the axioms. So uh, 
since for every alpha 1 and alpha 2 in W1, W2, this is an element of W, then in particular for every W1 and W2, uh, this sum W1 plus W2 belongs to W. So we verified this, pro th th this property. And now we uh, also need to show that uh, for every scalar, right, for every alpha, uh, we have that uh, W is closed with respect to multiplication by, by scalar. And then uh, the third property, this is like kind of one and two, this is one, this is two. So uh, the last thing we need to, to show is that if we choose, if we choose uh, alpha two to be zero, and um, you know alpha one just alpha, alpha one equals alpha, then uh, for every uh, w one, w two, uh, we have so alpha w one plus zero w two. This belongs, of course, to w by our assumption. But this is just the zero vector, so this is alpha w1, and this belongs to w for every w1 in w. So w is indeed a vector space in its own right, and so this is a subspace. So as an example of how to use those properties to verify that something is a vector space in its own right, so we have this nice proposition here. So uh, let's, uh, okay, maybe I'll, uh, yeah, I'll say it, but I'm, uh, Sorry, it's repeating myself so much. Let V be, uh, let's say, V uh, vector space. Let V be a vector space over F. From now on, on F is a field. And let uh, just U and W be subspaces of V. Okay. U and W are subspaces of V. Subspaces. Subspaces. Okay, then their intersection, the elements that are in common, uh, is a subspace of V. Well, this is well known, so uh, let's prove it using uh, using what we have formulated. So, uh, so proof, since uh, U and W are subspaces of V, then of course the zero vector belongs to U and the zero vector belongs to W. And this means that the zero vector belongs to U intersection W, okay? And now since U is a subspace of V, then for every, um, so for every, uh, let's say, alpha one and alpha two in F, and for every, uh, say, V one, V two, that are in the intersection, Right, so we have. So, since v one and v two are in the intersection, then v one and v two are in U, and v one and v two are also in uh, v two. Sorry, are also in W, and right because they are in the intersection. Now U is a subspace, so alpha one v1 so u is closed with respect to this uh, taking this linear combinations and alpha 2 v2 belongs to u and a uh, alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 also belongs to w and therefore this linear combination alpha 1 v1 plus alpha 2 v2 belongs to this intersection right so we have proven that this intersection has the zero vector and for all alpha one, alpha two, and f, and all two vectors in this intersection, the, this linear combinations belong to this space, and therefore this implies that U intersection W is a subspace of V. So whenever have, we have a vector space and we have vector subspaces of V, uh, and we take their intersection, the intersection is also a subspace of V. So clearly we have done that. Okay, so now the next important concept which uh, students have uh, often a hard time with is the span or the linear, uh, the collection of all linear combinations of uh, vectors. So the idea is actually quite intuitive and, and, and simple. So suppose we have here some, I don't know, say vector space V and we have some vectors V1 and uh, V2, I don't know. And so the question, yeah, the V here I draw it quite, quite concretely to be, say, uh, 
a model of R3, and I have any two vectors here. So obviously, just the two vectors, they do not form a vector space. But what I could ask is that what is the smallest vector subspace, let's call it R3, of R3, that contains both of those two vectors? And actually, it's quite intuitively obvious that the smallest subspace is actually the plane that is spanned by those two vectors. So every two vectors in R3, they define some subspace. And in general, in higher dimension spaces, every k vectors that, well, uh, I'll have to introduce the notion of linear independence to what I wanted to say, but every k vectors, say, uh, will we'll not make it rigorous for now, they define some uh, hyperplane or k-dimensional hy hyperplane will uh, will define it later. I just I'm just trying to say it intuitively here, right? So those two vectors define a unique plane here. So the idea is the following one. So uh, given a vector space v and a collection of vectors v1 on vk are just k vectors, k vectors. Yeah. So we can ask the following question. What is the smallest uh, subspace of V that contains uh, V1 up to VK. Okay. So uh, one thing would be obvious. If we're looking at a subspace of V, so obviously every subspace of V, when I take V1 and scale it up, alpha 1 V1, it has to be in this subspace. And every, every one of those vectors, I can say, take some scalar alpha K VK and scale each of those vectors up. And since this is a subspace, I'm looking for it. Yeah, I don't know what's the smallest one, but it has to contain all the scaled versions of those vectors, right? Well, I can scale them however I want. It is closed to a scalar multiplication, so it will contain those. And of course, it is closed to addition. So any sum of the following form will be, say, this subspace is U, will be in U, in the smallest subspace. So it seems that every subspace uh, of V that would contain those vectors has to contain all those linear combinations of this following form. And this motivates the following definition. So let us define this notion more rigorously, the span. So we have the following definition. So uh, let V be a vector space uh, over the field F. OK. Um, and let v1 up to vk be vectors of v. Okay. So uh, the space spanned by v1 up to vk is defined by So we write it as span of v1 up to vk. Okay? And sometimes uh, in uh, more advanced parts of algebra, we say the span over f, but this is clear in, in this context. So it is just the collection of all the possible linear combinations of all those scalings and sums. So this is alpha 1 v1 plus um, alpha k vk, yeah? such that alpha 1 up to alpha k are scalars in the field. So this is called the span. Yeah? And what we'll see is that this is actually the smallest subspace of V that contains all those vectors. So let us now prove this theorem. Now, hopefully, uh, what I'm saying here becomes logically more clear as in, in the way that I present. And when you see it in one shot, hopefully, the connections between the various definitions and the theorems and the properties, you see it in, in, in one shot altogether. So um, hopefully it's, I'm achieving the goal. Uh, 
So let's uh, formulate the following proposition. Okay, so so let uh, v be a vector space uh, over the field f. Okay, and uh, then the span as we defined span uh yeah i need i need to uh, over the field f and say here sorry for v1 up to vk are elements of v then span v1 up to vk is the smallest subspace of v uh, containing V, v1 up to vk okay and let's see why is that well first uh in, in the proof i need to prove two things first of all i need to prove that uh this span is indeed a vector space and in order to show that this is the smallest one i need to show that every vector space uh, every vector subspace of v that contains those vectors will also contain their span okay so uh the proof is the following one so let's uh say the set W is, let's call W the set, which is the span of V1 up to VK, right? Okay, so first of all, I need to show that this is indeed a subspace of V, okay? So obviously, when we take the trivial uh, linear combinations, that is, we take all the scalars to be zero, then uh, clearly, the zero vector of V belongs to W. So uh, W, is uh, not empty, right? This, 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 is, this is one, and we have the zero vector is in W. Now, uh, yeah, and of course, you know, just uh, to make sure we need at least K to be obviously at least one, so we have at least one vector here. So we have the zero vector. And now, uh, by our previous statement, we need to show that uh, whenever we take two vectors in W, two vectors in W, then their linear combination is in W. So now let W1 and W2 be vectors in W. So then, so since W1 is in W, it is in the span, so we can find scalars, there exists scalars, such that W is the sum of alpha 1 uh, v uh, alpha i v i i goes from y uh, from one to k. Sorry, yeah. There, there are some scal scalars because just so because of the structure by right? the definition of w for every vector that is in w it has to be written uh, as a linear combination of those, and the same for w two. For w two we can write it as just sum of beta i uh, v i i goes from one to k. Okay, and now. Uh, uh, Therefore, uh, for every, if we take alpha beta, which are in F, uh, uh, we have, so if we take alpha W1 plus beta W2, then this turns out to be the sum alpha alpha i plus beta beta i times V i, i goes from 1 to k, and we see that this is again a linear combination of the v's and therefore it belongs to w so w is a subspace thus w is uh, by the property that we prove proved uh, is a subspace of v okay this this is done now why w is the smallest so suppose suppose uh, that u is a subspace of v that contains uh, v1 up to vk then it's just as we said as we said then uh, for all alpha 1 up to alpha k uh, in f um, 
alpha 1 v1 and up to alpha k vk since u is a space then it has to be closed with respect to multiplication by scalars so all those vectors are going to be in u and since u is closed since u is closed uh, to addition so this sum of alpha i vi i goes from 1 to k will also belong to you but this is a general vector in the span which means that w is a subset of u but the w is the span so therefore the span is the smallest subspace of v that contains those because every other subspace of v uh, that will contain those vectors will contain w so this proves the theorem that proposition okay so uh, okay so now we're arriving at the next important concept uh, uh, in, in linear algebra, and this is the concept of linear independence. So, uh, for example, uh, consider uh, the important example of Rn, the n-dimensional space. We'll define the notion of dimension later. But, so we can take every, uh, uh, yeah, every vector. Suppose we take the vector x1 up to xn okay so first what we can say is that well we can write every vector in the following way this is x1 times 1 0 0 yeah, 0 and plus x2 and here it's 0 1 0 and here is all the way and plus etc xn times this vector ta -ta 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 -ta, up to 1 here this is actually the vector E1, this is E2, and this is the vector En. Okay, so uh, in general, EI would be this vector, this is zero, and this is one in the I slot. And yeah, this is it. So what we can see here is that if we look at this set of vectors E1 up to En, this is just N vectors, right? but they're in a way uh, unique. Uh, well, well, they're not unique, but there is a nice property about them. And the property is that every vector in Rn can be expressed. Every vector in Rn is a linear combination of those vectors. So we can uh, as well say that Rn is the span of those vectors, right? Rn is the span of those vectors. And this situation, if we add other vectors here, I don't know, we can add as many vectors as we, as we want, and we will still have that our n is the span of those vectors. So this is called a spanning set. So this would motivate the definition. This is just, uh, the, this set is much more than just a spanning set. Uh, so remember this example here, but now let's define the notion of the spanning set. What do, do we mean by, by a span? So definition. So consider the following definition. So let v be a vector space. Okay, so uh, let uh, v1 up to vk uh, be uh, in v vectors. Well, obviously, and the set. So if you consider this finite set v1 up to vk is said to be a spinning set for v uh, if if v is just the span of v1 up to vk so if already every vector in v is a linear combination of those vectors. So this is the definition of the spanning set. So uh, again, if we consider the example of Rn and we choose the vectors E1 up to the n, then we saw as the spanning set for it. So we can see uh, another feature that this set is in a sense minimal, right? Because if we consider this set E1 up to En in the case of Rn, if we uh, discard any one of those vectors, if we get rid of any one of them, then this is no longer a spanning set. So in the sense it's minimal because we need all of them to, to spin. 
On the other hand, we can inflate this set. We can add, for example, the zero vector here, and we can add as many vectors here as we please. It will still be a spinning set, uh, but you know we inflate it needlessly. We add redundancy to it. So in a sense, we would like to have a set that is spinning and at the same time is minimal. So this leads us to the definition or to the notion of the linear independence. So in, when we're talking about linearly independent set, linear independent sets uh, in, in a way that we will define, they are in a sense um, minimal, uh, uh, tend to be as, as, as small as, as they can, and they do not, let's say just this way, linearly independent sets do not contain redundancies in uh, the sense that we will show uh, soon. So let us define first definition, the notion of linear dependence. So when two vect when vectors are linearly linear uh, dependence. Okay, so the idea is the following one. So let V be a vector space over okay over the field f okay and so uh, the vectors v1 up to vk in v are said to be linearly dependent um, if there exists scholars alpha 1 up to alpha k in F and here is the important part not all of which not all of which are zeros so not all the scholars are zeros such that such that uh, the sum sum of alpha i v i i goes from one to k is zero okay that's that's the idea so um, for example for example uh, so example um, every set that contains the zero vector is linearly dependent. Uh, let's see why is it so. So suppose we have here the zero and have we have your vector v1 and have here the vector vk. So what we can take here is we can take one times this plus zero times that plus 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 zero times that and we're having the zero vector. But those colors, right, here are those colors. Not all of them are zero. This is non zero. So we have written the zero vector in a non trivial way. Uh, we have found a non trivial linear combination. So not all the scalars are zero and we got the zero vector. So this is the notion of the linear dependence. And equivalently, we can formulate and say, what does it mean to be for a set to be uh, linearly independent? So uh, let us first say what the redundancy that I was talking about means here. So proposition. So let V be a vector space over the field F. Okay, so that's a vector field, uh, a ve vector space over the field, <laughs> over the field F. Sorry about that. Uh, and let v1 up to vk be a spinning set. OK, 
Okay, so what happens is that when we take a spanning set and we add another vector to it, we are uh, inevitably, inevitably going to get a set that is linearly dependent. Then, for every v in v, the set, if we look at this following set v, and here we have v1 up to vk, so if v1 v1 up to vk is a spinning set, then this set is linearly dependent. Okay, and here's the proof. Here's the proof. So uh, since this set v1 up to vk uh, spans v, spans v, then there exists there exists scalars alpha one up to alpha k such that uh, we have that v is a linear combination of those. This is alpha one v one plus plus alpha k vk right so we have this and now we can take it everything to the other side thanks to the property that we've proved then you know uh, taking multiplying it by minus one is just the minus the just the additive inverse so this means by the property that we've proved that v minus alpha one v one minus ta 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 all the way up to minus alpha k vk is zero but look at this, this coefficient of this vector is one, right? And I don't know what those are, but this means that there's a linear combination of elements of the set uh, V and V1 up to VK, such that not all the scalars are zero, because this one is not zero, and we have the zero vector. Thus, the set V up to V1 Vk uh, is linearly dependent. So uh, an important bit of intuition here is that spinning sets uh, tend to be redundant. They tend to be as big as they can because when you add elements to spinning sets, there is no way for you to ruin uh, to ruin the spinning property, right? So spinning sets need to be, in a sense, big enough to so that every vector in the vector space is a linear combination of them. And moreover, when you take a spinning set and you add a, at least one redundant vector into it, or any vector that you add to the spinning set, you will have a set that is automatically linearly dependent. So um, linearly, in the linearly dependent sets, uh, let, let's say it this way, uh, when we add uh, a vector to a spinning set, we get a set that is linearly dependent. And a set that is linearly dependent means that it contains some redundancy, as we will formalize in the following lemma here. And we'll, we'll show you uh, what I mean what I mean by redundancy. So whenever we have a, spet, a, a set of uh, uh, vectors that is spinning, there's a way for us to throw away one of the vectors and still obtain a spinning set. Uh, this is the following. Uh, uh, this is the following uh, essence of the following lemma. Or at least, if we have uh, a spinning. Uh, so, sorry, uh, if we have a set that is linearly dependent, we have a way of taking a vector in this set, tossing it away, discarding it from the set, and still obtain a set that spans the same subspace of V. So this lemma is super important. Uh, I think this is one of the most important lemmas and it's important to understand because it will uh, appear in future proofs uh, and will be reused here. So let's formalize this lemma. So let V be a vector space. Okay. Uh, let over f over the field f, whatever, yeah. Uh, let v1 up to vk, and it's important, be uh, non-zero 
non-zero. This is important. All of them are non-zero, linearly dependent vectors. Okay, uh, they are all non-zero, they are linearly dependent, then there exists a vector that is a linear combination of its predecessors. Okay, there's a vector that is a linear combination of its predecessors. So this vector is a redundant one because uh, we, we don't really need this. We can write it. The, we have vectors that are coming in the list before him and we can use them to express him. So if we toss this vector away, we are having another set which is smaller and just spans the same subspace. So let's see the proof. So the proof is really nice. And uh, we'll see that we need to use the uh, non-zeroness. Uh, by the way, if we have a, a set of vectors that is linearly dependent, and you know we have some zero vectors in there, we can always toss them away, and uh, you know just remain with the non-zero ones, and we'll still have something that is linearly dependent. Okay, so uh, oh wait, it's not necessarily true. No, no, forget what I said. Uh, uh, sorry, forget what I said. Uh, just suppose for now that we have k vectors that are non-zero here, okay? So, uh, since the vectors are linearly dependent, this means, you know, by the definition, here, here's the important thing, because students who do not fully understand the definitions will really have a hard time uh, following the proof, because the proof goes all, you know, all according to the definition. And so this is why it's important, in my opinion, to see all the material in one shot and the connection between uh, the definitions and theorems and the lemmas and the proofs, they, it all connects together in a really uh, coherent and a very consistent way. So. Uh, since the vector is linearly dependent, then this means that there are scalars alpha 1 up to alpha k in the field, not all of which are 0, such that this sum of alpha 1, v1, up to alpha k, vk is 0. Okay, that's the definition. Um, how do I use it to my advantage to show that there is a vector that is the linear combination of its predecessors? So now let us define, let j be the maximal index, the maximal index such that alpha j is non zero. So if you want to write this formally, we would say that j is just the maximum, maximal i, such that, you know, i is in the set from one to k, and that alpha i is non-zero. Okay, good. So uh, since all those vectors are, this is the uh, important part, this is where we use the assumption that all the vectors are non-zero. So since uh, uh, the vectors, the vectors are non-zero, then this j is strictly bigger than 1. Because if we had, you know, j obviously cannot be, if all the vectors are, if all the scalars are 0, right, then this would contradict the assumption that not all the scalars are 0. So not all of them are 0, but if j is 1, so the maximal non-zero, uh, the coefficient with the, max, uh, the maximal index of the coefficient that is non-zero is 1, then this would mean that alpha 1 v1 is 0, but this would imply, since we are in the field, this is important, since we're in the field and alpha 1 is non-zero by assumption, then it has multiplicative inverse, right? So we could multiply this by uh, the multiplicative inverse of alpha in the field, and we know that such exists because alpha is non-zero by assumption. Then uh, this 
this is again an axiom you know, that uh, you know we can multiply it in the order that we want but this is just one times v but this is v but on the other hand any scalar times times the zero vector it's another property we've proved will be zero so this would imply that v is zero and this is a contradiction so that's that's an important point here so what i'm saying is that clearly j is bigger than one so let j be again the maximal index such that alpha j is not zero so it perfectly could be that j is equal to k it could be but it, it j is at least one that's what i'm saying here okay and so then the sum that we have is actually alpha one v one plus it stops at alpha j uh, v j because all the coefficients after j uh, has to be zero, right? Alpha j alpha j is non-zero, and all all the coefficients after it must be zero. But it could be that j is equal to k, and uh, there are no coefficients after it. So, it, but you know, it doesn't limit the generality. So this is equal to zero, and then this means that uh, alpha j uh, v j is minus alpha one v one, and minus alpha j minus one v j minus one and again j is, j is strictly bigger than one and now since this is non-zero again we see the importance of being in a field this has a multiplicative inverse so we can in a sense multiply by the inverse of alpha j or divide by it and then we would have that v j is uh, minus alpha j inverse times alpha one, all of it, V one, and minus, 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 alpha J minus one times alpha J, uh, alpha J to the power of minus one, alpha J minus one, V J minus one, right? And so see what we got here. We've actually got to write V J as the linear combination of its predecessors. And that completes the proof. So there's a vector that is linear combination of its predecessors, and therefore, if we will, we have discarded alpha j from this set of vectors, then it would not have affected uh, the spanning subspace because we could, you know, uh, reconstruct it, we could reproduce it with uh, its predecessors. Okay, so that's that's an important property. So now we can talk about linear independence. So, so definition okay so uh, well linear independence is just the lo logical follow-up of linear dependence this means that okay let's, let's define it so linear independence okay so let v be a vector space over yeah i'm not getting tired of saying it the field f okay uh okay and let v1 up to vk be vectors in v okay so the vectors v1 up to the k or if you would say the set that contains those vectors v1 up to vk uh, is said to be linearly independent if so whenever we have uh this sum of alpha i v i i goes from 1 to k equals to 0 then this implies that all the scalars have to be 0 that alpha 1 equals alpha 2 equals all the way up to alpha k equals 0 so what it says that when we have linearly independent vectors the only way that we can write the zero vector is as the trivial combination. It's just to take all the scalars uh, zero. So in the sense, uh, 
if you want to see something intuitive, right? So suppose that we have in one dimension, we have a vector v here, yeah, right? So we cannot have another vector here, for example, that is uh, in the same direction. So for example, because we could have here minus v. And so if we have v and minus v, then there is a way to write the zero vector as the sum of those, right? And not all the coefficients are zero. So it means that uh, for vectors to be linearly independent, they are not supposed to lie in the same, not in the one dimensional case, they're not supposed to lie in the same line, the vectors. And uh, for the two dim in, in, the in three dimensions, so three vectors are linearly independent if they don't lie in the same pla uh, plane. Okay, so uh, that's kind of it's called the general positions, right? So uh, linear linear independence means that there is no other way to express the zero vectors uh, as the sum of those vectors uh, unless we take all the coefficients to be zero. So, uh, and this is an important property. So let's write this proposition that follows. Okay, so let V be a vector space. Okay, and let V1 up to vk in v uh, be linearly independent vectors. Okay, so we said that. Uh, then actually, it's not that the only that the zero vector can be written uniquely as only as the trivial combination of those vectors. It's not only true for the zero vector, but every vector that lies in their span can be written as in a unique way as their linear combination. Uh, then, for every v that lies in the span of v1 up to vk, uh, every v that lies in the span, there exists unique scalars uh, alpha 1 up to alpha k in f such that v is the linear combination of those. So this is alpha i v i I goes from one to from one to k. Yeah. So, and we'll see that this property of unique representation is quite important. Uh, we've actually seen it in in our n, right? So, uh, or in our three that if we take the standard, well, we, we call it the standard basis. But you know, we've seen in, for example, in our three, if we take any vector x, y, z, then you know those vectors can be this every vector. Of this form can be written in a unique way as there's only one combination that makes it right. This is a trivial way and this is the only way to write it as the linear combination of the vectors e1, e2, and e3 as those are linearly independent. We can write uniquely the vector, the zero vector as their linear combination and therefore as we will prove every vector can be written uniquely as in this case as their linear combination. So let us prove uh, let us write the proof. So uh, suppose so clearly for every vector in 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 the span of those vectors there will, will be scalars that uh, you know such that this vector is this linear combination of those because it's by the definition of the span. So suppose uh, there are beta one uh, up to beta k such that uh, in addition to the alphas such that v is this sum of alpha i v i, i goes from 1 to k, and v is also the sum of beta i v i, i goes from 1 to k, and we actually have to show that all the alphas are equal to all the betas, and using the assumption that the vectors v i are linearly independent. So suppose we have two representations, then what this means is that the zero vector is this v minus v, right? So v minus v, 
is the zero vector. On the other hand, this is the sum of alpha i minus beta i, and here it's vi, where i goes from one to k. And this is zero. But those vectors are linearly independent, and we have the zero vector written as their linear combination. Therefore, all the coefficients has to be zero. This is the definition of linear independence. And that's why I keep saying that students who don't really understand or remember the definitions struggle with the material, but not because they're not smart enough. They're always smart enough because they were smart enough to get into university, but just because they uh, missed the, the definition and they didn't complete it. So, you know, first thing first, whenever you start into any exam, be sure that you know all the definitions and you understand them. And this implies that, you know, all uh, alpha i minus beta i has to be zero. This means that alpha i equals to beta i. And you see, just like that, we've proved this property that whenever we have a linearly independent set, then every vector in their span is can be represented as their unique, in a unique way, as their linear combination. So this is an important property that we would like to maintain. And here we're coming, uh, we're, we're arriving again to at one of the uh, most important theorems in this course. And after that, we will be able to uh, to show that the notion of dimension is well defined and to talk about bases and things like that. So this is a theorem and one of the most important ones. Uh, and if you understand well the definitions, this theorem is, uh, I mean, it's the proof is beautiful and it's quite, uh, the proof is quite straightforward. And it will now make, uh, allow us to formulate more rigorously what we mean when we say that spanning sets tend to be big and redundant, while linearly independent set tend to be small as they can be. Well, we'll, we'll formulate it, uh, this uh, intuitive, intuitive uh, hand waviness will now have a rigorous meaning. So, of course, uh, when we have a spanning set, you know, adding vectors to it, we cannot ruin, ruin it, obviously, because it will continue uh, to span uh, the space if we add more vectors, we cannot ruin it. Uh, and if we have a linearly independent set, then if we remove vectors from it, then it will keep uh, being linearly uh, independent. We will not ruin the linear independence by removing vectors. But on the other hand, if we have a spanning set and we take a vector away, then we can maybe we take, take out an essential vector and we can ruin the spanning property. And similarly, in a linearly independent set, when we uh, when we take a linearly independent set and we add vectors to it, maybe now it's linearly dependent. If we add a vector that is a linear combination of the vectors that are already in the set, so the following theorems theorem shows the important uh, property. So let v be a vector space over the field F. Okay, so that's a vector field over uh, uh, a vector. <laughs> well, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I know I keep saying vector field. Let me be a vector space over the field F. Yeah, I mean I I, I love vector fields. I love calculus, but uh, yeah, sorry for it. Uh, anyway, so let me v be a vector space over the field F, and let uh, v1 up to vm be a spinning set for v, meaning that every vector in v can be written as a linear combination of v1 up to vm. Okay, and let u1 up to uk be a linearly uh, in the and then set, right? So let this be a linearly independent set, okay? Then what I'm saying is the following one, the following thing. K is never bigger than M. So let's see what's the meaning of this. So what I'm saying is that any spanning set, take the smallest possible spanning set, whatever, and take the biggest possible linearly independent set, any spanning set will have 
more elements than any linearly independent set, or at least the same number. But there is no way that a linearly independent set can have more elements than a spinning set. So th this is this is of crucial importance, and it's important to understand this now. Intuitively, it's supposed to be clear by now uh, why it holds. And let's see the beautiful proof for this property. And hopefully, once you see this proof, many things in the course will be clear. So uh, we may assume that the vectors v1 up to vm, vm are non-zero. Those vectors are non-zero. Uh, and well, why we may assume that? Because if suppose that there are some zeros here, right? So this set would be uh, would contain zeros, and we can just ignore the zeros and focus on the non-zeros. And there are supposed to be non-zero vectors because after all, this is a spanning set that spans the space V, unless V is the trivial zero space, but suppose that V is not the zero space. So there are non-zero vectors here. Uh, and if we discard the zeros, we end up with a smaller set. And uh, if we show that for this smaller spanning set, the number of elements uh, is bigger than in any linearly independent set, then, you know, then the original had set obviously had even more uh, elements. So assume that those are non zero, uh, so I will write without loss of generality. So we may assume that all those vectors are non zero. Okay. And so now uh, we consider the set, consider the set. Okay, let's add this vector u1 to the beginning, and here we have the set v1 up to vm. Okay, so what can we say about this set? Well, this set has to be linearly dependent because we've taken, as we've proved, we've taken a spinning set and we've added a, uh, a vector to it. And since we add a vector to a spinning set, this means that this uh, set is already linearly dependent. Okay, but we assume that all those are non-zero, and u is coming from a linearly independent set, so u is also non-zero. So now we are returning to the case of the proposition that we have all vectors that are non-zero vectors, and those non-zero vectors uh, are now form a linearly dependent set, and then there is a vector that has a linear combination of its predecessors. Uh, this is a linearly dependent set of non-zero vectors. Then, thus, there exists, say, V, uh, I don't know, VI, that is say vi1 that is a linear combination of its predecessors okay uh, and well of course it's not u1 u1 has no predecessors so uh, say vi1 is a linear combination uh, of uh, its predecessors. Uh, so we can uh, we can therefore discard this vi1. So say it's somewhere here, vi1. It's here. So if we discard it, right, then you know because we could express it as a linear combination of the vectors that come before it, that doesn't affect uh, the span because we can take this linear combination of those to replace this. And then we take the vectors that we had previously, and we have the same span, uh, span right? Uh, we can uh, discard. This is one of the v's that is a linear combination uh, of its predecessors v1, and still have a spanning set. And here's the thing, we can continue with this process, we will continue with taking and adding at each step one more u, 
and discarding one of the Vs yeah? until uh, uh, until we get rid of all of the Vs. So here's the thing. So uh, here is suppose yeah, suppose that uh, we want to, to, to arrive at a contradiction. So suppose that actually K is bigger than M. And if K is bigger than M will yield a contradiction, then it will mean that K has to be no bigger than M, that is K is smaller or equal to M. Suppose that K is bigger than M and suppose uh, inductively that uh, after uh, there oh, were defined L uh, sets. So this set is V1, uh, sorry, so this is U1 up to, sorry, U1 up to UL, right? We've added all of those U's and here we have V1 and here we will have VI1 that has been discarded. So I will write a hat over it, which means that this set is omitted, this vector is omitted from the list. And here we have VIL that is omitted from the list. And here we have VM. Those sets uh, that uh, are spinning. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And each of the V, I, M, I don't know, J's uh, was a linear combination of its predecessors. So suppose that we have been able to replace uh, L of the V's by L U's in the following manner, in L steps, so that at each step we get a linearly, uh, uh, sorry, at each step we get a spinning set. So. Again, uh, let's go over this again. Uh, as we've seen on, at, the, at step number one, we could take at u1 to this spinning set and then discard one of the vectors and still obtain a spinning set. And then suppose inductively that we were, be, were able to perform this uh, L steps, right? L steps, uh, we added L of the vectors ul and we uh, discarded L of the v's. And now we want to prove that uh, that we can continue with this uh, process. So uh, the inductive step, right? Um, now, uh, the set is spinning. So adding UL plus one, we obtain the linearly dependent set which is u1 ul ul plus one and here we have say v1 by the way v1 could be in the list it could have been omitted but you know just for the convenience so here's vi1 and here's vi l hat and this is vm so uh, this I1 can be the V1 and VIL can be VM. So, but you know, it's not necessarily that it comes in, in this order that they're strictly smaller, but just for clarity of what I mean by that, those vectors were, were omitted. And now uh, this set is linearly dependent and of non-zero vectors of non-zero vectors. Because we assume that the v's are non-zero and the u's are elements of a linearly independent set, that so they have to be non-zero. And so we've taken the linearly independent set and we added a vector to it. And by proposition that we have already proved, we have a set that is linearly dependent. And thus, there exists by our proposition a vector that is a linear combination of its predecessors. 
Okay, that's a linear combination of its predecessors. But here's the important point. It's not one of the U's, right? Why? Because the U's are linearly independent. So if there was a U here that is a linear combination of its predecessors, then this would mean that the U's are linearly de dependent, but they're not. Okay, so this vector is one of the vectors say let's write this list v1 vi1 hat which is the hat means that this is omitted from the list vil hat is omitted and vm so there exists uh, v uh, i l plus one that in this list that is not omitted that is a linear combination of its predecessors okay so we can discard it and still obtain a linearly, uh, uh, not linearly, a uh, spinning set, okay? So, and the set that we're going to have is U1 up to UL plus one and here we're going to have v1, vi1, uh, and up to vil plus 1. This is omitted, and here is vm. And v1 and v vm clearly can be uh, among the omitted vectors, but I just write it for clarity in this way. So the inductive step, the inductive step uh, is proved. So at each step, I add one of the U's and then uh, I kick out, kick away one of the V's. And I can keep doing it because, uh, and, and still at each step uh, obtain a spinning set because I uh, discard the redundant vector here. So, uh, and the point is the following one. So after we assume that K, K is bigger than M. So after uh, um, M steps, yeah, after m steps, so it's never the case that u, one of the u's, because the u's are linearly independent, is a linear combination of, of predecessors. We have, so we only kick the v's, the set u1 up to um, which is spinning. This is spinning, and this is also linearly independent by our assumption. Now, k is at least, is at least, since it's an integer, is at least m plus 1. Uh, then, this, since this spread is, uh, is spinning, this implies that the set, when I add the m plus 1's vector, u1, um, and here is um plus 1, is so I took this spinning set and added a vector to it is linearly dependent. And this is a contradiction. This is a contradiction because the U's are assumed to be linearly independent and every subset of a linearly independent set is also linearly independent. So this is a contradiction, but it stemmed for, from, from what? That we could replace all the v's by u's. So we assume that we have more, uh, more uh, u's by, by th than v's. So we kicked out all the v's and we, there was still a u that we can add, right? This means that the contradiction stemmed from the assumption that k is bigger than m, which means that essentially k is smaller or equal to m. So if you understood everything up to this part, this is this is very good. 
because this is like essential for understanding the the rest of the material of the course. Um, okay. 